As Pastor Brett said, I do want to encourage you to join us in the fast next week, January 11th through the 15th. You can get one of those booklets that we have online or outside as you exit today. Well, I grew up um, in this church. I, uh, I came here when I was 10 years old. And like you, I fell in love with the, the preaching. Pastor Brett, every time he brought the word of God, it was powerful. It spoke to my life. The worship was just like it, is, it was this morning. Spirit anointed. It was easy to find God. I love the, the diversity. I love coming in to the church and seeing black and white and Hispanic and Asian. But a couple of years after going to the church, I heard Pastor Brett talk about our vision. And he might have said it before this, before the moment that I heard it, but it was the first time that I really heard it for the first time. God opened my eyes to the calling that we had as a church. And it was this vision of winning the city, winning the city, seeing Washington, D.C., the suburbs of Northern Virginia, the suburbs of Maryland, the whole metropolitan area bow its knee to Jesus Christ, to see the business world, to see politics, to see government, to see education be impacted by the gospel. And it was, a, it was a big vision. It was a vision. I mean, up until that point, as a young man, I had aspirations. I wanted to go into politics. I wanted to maybe go into sports or be a sports broadcaster. But all of my dreams, all of my aspirations were small in that they only involved me. And this was the first vision that I heard that was bigger than me. It was multi-generational. It was multi-ethnic. It would take all of us pulling our weight and more people that weren't there at the time, more people that aren't here right now to bring about this vision. And I recognize it, it's a daunting vision to win the city. Where do you even start with that? But I want to challenge us today as a people as we're heading into 20, or as we're in 2021 to go beyond just what can church do for me, to go beyond just the things that we like about Grace Covenant, and to think, how might God be calling me to participate in this vision of winning the city? And I'd imagine there are some initial questions that you might have when you hear win the city. I mean, not many of us go around with... Uh, Nike's vision on our mind or maybe an organization or we're not going around saying mission statements and vision statements. So what should be different about the church? Why should we get excited about this vision? Why should we devote our lives to it? Especially considering, you know, we're raising our families, we're going to work, we're trying to provide. Some of you have your side hustle, you're working it, you're doing different things, you have your own aspirations. Why should you care? Second question, how should we engage in our city's culture, in its current non-one state. Last I checked, we haven't yet won the city. If you agree with that, nod your head. Your, your workplace is probably not opening up in prayer. The events on the Capitol prove that we have a long way to go. So how should Christians, how should we engage in our culture right now? And then thirdly, how do we actually do this? I mean, it seems like an impossible vision. How do we, what strategy or, or uh, large scale initiatives can we do to see this transformation of our city? And that's where we're going today. And there's a blueprint for us in Acts chapter 17, verses 16 through 34, with the Apostle Paul and a city very similar to ours called Athens. The title of this message, if you haven't guessed by now, is Win the City. Acts 17, 16 through 34. It's a larger portion of scripture, but an important one. It says, now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a pre preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, 
saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting? For, you're bringing, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you're very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. It is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Verse 29. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the, that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he's fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he's given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Paul's on his second missionary journey here. He's been in cities like Philippi, and Thessalonica, and Berea, and he's seen some incredible gospel fruit. He's seen some radical salvations. But he's also experienced some pretty intense oppositions. He was thrown in jail in Philippi. He was uh, kicked out of Thessalonica. He had to flee in the night. In Berea, the same thing. And so now he's in Athens and he's waiting for his compatriots, Timothy and Silas. I'd imagine he's kind of catching his breath. And he's walking through the city. Maybe he was doing a prayer walk, waiting for Timothy and Silas to come. Kind of taking it all in. And Athens was an impressive city much like our city today. It was the intellectual metropolis of the Roman Empire. It was the native city of Socrates and Plato and the adopted home of Aristotle and Epicurus and the leader of the Stoics, Zeno. Its architecture could be just described as majestic. There was the famous Acropolis. It was this high hill that you could be seen from miles away an ancient citadel that housed the Athenians' temples. And there were a lot of them. There was the Parthenon, a great temple dedicated to Athena. There was temples to the goddess Roma. There was even one to the emperor, Augustus, who had been dead for 30 years. There were statues of Apollo and Jupiter and Venus and the whole Greek Pantheon. In fact, an author during that time, he was exaggerating a, a bit, but he said it was easier to find a god in Athens than a person. Now, as Paul is walking around this city, he's waiting for Timothy and Silas. Our text says that his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. I'd imagine that as he's walking around, the air feels thin. He can feel the demonic oppression. He can feel the intensity of the opposition of all these idols and all these shrines and statues and temples. And his spirit becomes provoked. The word there means greatly distressed, aroused to anger. There's, there's an anger building up on the inside of Paul. The city was full of idols. It was literally smothered in idols. One of my good friends, Pastor Corey, talked about a missions trip that he went to in India. And India has millions of gods. And he said he woke up one night as if there was a demon choking his neck. 
because there was so much intense opposition. There was so much demonic activity and idolatry in that city. That's what Athens was like. You could feel the heaviness as you walked around. And here Paul is angry. I thought Christians weren't allowed to get angry. I thought Christians weren't allowed to get provoked. Why is Paul angry? Why is his soul troubled as he walks around this city of Athens? Well, Paul, he he grew up as a Jew. He underwent strict Jewish training. He memorized large portions of what we now call the Old Testament. And I imagine that as he's walking around, that Jewish background and his studies, those verses are coming to his head. The Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. The first commandment of the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. Isaiah 42, 8, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, God is a jealous God. And we think of that word as purely negative. But God is passionate about his glory. God is jealous for the Athenians to experience his love, his protection, and his provision. And instead of the people's devotion being directed to him, it's being directed to these fake gods. It's being directed to a Roman emperor who's been dead for 30 years, who's powerless to affect their situation. Ultimately, idols promise protection, provision, in some kind of relationship with those who worship them, but they deliver nothing. And as Paul walks this city, God's righteous anger becomes his own. His spirit is provoked for the people to truly encounter the God who created them. And maybe we're 2,000 years removed from ancient Athens quite a few thousand miles from the city here in Washington, D.C. But the same idolatry smothers our city. Let me give you a couple examples. First, why are we so busy? I mean, even in a pandemic, when we were stuck at home, why are we so? We found, we found ways to be busy, even confined to our homes. Why can't we unplug from emails after a day's work? Or on vacation. We've made an idol out of busyness and look to busyness to provide security, significance, and happiness. Why are we so obsessed with chasing after promotions? Well, we serve titles and positions that promise power. Why do we engage in endless social media debates with comments that are full of truth but empty of grace and love? We idolize being right. What does your anger this morning provoke you to do? To disengage? To shame? Or to engage the culture? To engage the city that we find ourselves in? Paul's anger led him not to withdraw, not to bash, but to engage. Verse 17, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. I see Paul doing whatever he can to engage whoever he can. He's in the church, in the synagogues, with the Jewish people, with the religious people, pointing them to Jesus, the Messiah. He's in the marketplace with the common folks, our equivalent of maybe the bar or the water cooler. He's with the Epicureans and the Stoics, the educated, the big thinkers. There's no one off limits to Paul when it comes to engaging. And if we're gonna win the city, we can't be so outraged by the idolatry or so intimidated by the vast amounts of idols in our city that we fail to engage the culture. 
We got to engage the suburbs of Loudoun and Fairfax and Prince William. We got to rub shoulders with congressmen and congresswomen. We have to be a church that continues to go and reach the poor and the disenfranchised. And after working it like only Paul could, engaging with everyone he came into contact with, he's given this opportunity to address the Areopagus. Now, the Areopagus was a court of religion and of politics. And remember one of our initial questions. How do we engage the city in its non-one state? How do we engage a city when your workplace, there's so many people jockeying for power or on social media when there's so much polarization? Well, here's two ways. I want to give you two ways this morning that Paul engages the culture. Number one, he looked for a starting place. Look at verse 22. Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus. Now, how would you and I address this people? You've seen all these idols, right? You have a, I mean, for Paul, he had this Jewish background of, of one God. I mean, you and I would start with the outrage. We would start with all the things wrong. I mean, I am a parent. And often when I talk to my kids, I start with all the wrong things I see them doing. But here's what Paul does. Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you're very religious. (laughs) Paul is really trying to find some common ground here. He's seeing all these idols and, and he's saying, well, at least you're very devoted At least you're a passionate people. So allow me as a fellow passionate person to speak into this situation. He's searching for some commonality. He's searching for a starting point. And he says, as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Here was a people with Socrates and Aristotle and all the famous philosophers, the Stoics, the Epicureans. They have answers for everything. And yet they had one thing they didn't have an answer for huh, maybe there's another God that we haven't thought of. Well, we'll erect this altar to the unknown God. And Paul picks up on that. Hey, there's something you don't know about. The unknown God. Let me tell you a little bit about this unknown God. If you want to engage the culture, people with radically different worldview than you, people that don't want anything to do with Jesus, people that in your flesh you're triggered by, you got to search for a starting point. You gotta search for a starting point. I don't know for you if it's, maybe it's an Etsy shop. Maybe it's a mom blog. Maybe it's a barber chair. Me and a couple buddies, we started something called Be A Man Journey. Not a lot of millennial guys are coming up to me and asking me, hey Steven, uh, I need to repent. How do I do that? But they're trying to figure out how to be a dad. They're trying trying to figure out how to be a husband. They're trying to figure out how to succeed in their workplace. So we're going to use manhood as the the starting point, as the commonality. And along the way, we're going to introduce people to the gospel. What passions do you have? What side business do you have? What commonality do you have with your neighbor that allows an entry point to the gospel? Paul was a master of studying his culture. And don't be so outraged by the idolatry that you fail to observe where you can connect, where you can bring the hope and the life of the gospel. Now, that's an embarrassing clap. You either got to commit to it or you not. Okay, thank you. He looks for a starting place as he engages the culture, but then secondly, he deconstructs the lies. And this is where we have to be truth bearers. We're called to be truth bearers. We're called to see our culture And there are redemptive aspects of every culture. It's part of being created in the image of God is there are things that we can find in arts and music and sports that regardless of whether they're Christian or not, we can celebrate it. But then there are also parts of a culture that need to be deconstructed, that need to be exposed as lies. And Paul needs to address the fact that there are these shrines to countless idols. There are these temples that people are devoted to that are not worshiping God. Verse 24, He says, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath in everything. Paul's about to deconstruct the foolishness 
of idolatry. He's about to expose it for what it is. He says, here you all crafting your majestic architecture, your incredible temples that you built on this high mountain for everyone to see. They're temples that you yourselves crafted. You created them. You're looking for something to provide you provision and protection that, you, that was dependent on you creating. And these jobs that we desperately seek in our time, that we jockey for, they didn't exist five years ago. Someone created that job. Someone crafted what has become an idol for us. And we're looking for that to satisfy us when it didn't exist a couple years ago. The Athenians, they crafted their temples and their idols. Their idols were dependent on them creating them. But then they also cared for them. They would go around the city and they would wash their idols and pretend to feed their idols. Their idols needed caring for. Think of the irony of that. That as we serve our idol of busyness, we have to keep checking our emails and keep looking for job promotions and better job availability. Always looking and keeping an eye out for the, someone who might take our position, who might take our power. We have to care for the very idols that we've erected. On the other hand, Paul says that God hasn't been created. He is the creator. And not only that, he doesn't need us to serve him with human hands. He's not dependent on you and me. Last time I checked, God in his existence is not relying on whether you obey or don't obey him. He's done perfectly fine without you and without me. He transcends what we can bring him. He's God. He's Yahweh. Here's a second way Paul deconstructs the Athenian culture. Verse 26. He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. Now, the Athenians had this belief that they were a separate, special race. They were specially created from the soil of Greece. They had the slaves to prove their superiority. And what Paul deconstructs in that moment is that, no, 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 we all came from one man. We all came from Adam. We're all descendants of Adam, regardless of our ethnicity. So yes, we're not colorblind. We celebrate our diversity. Revelation 7 says that there will be every nation, tongue, and tribe. There will be people that look completely different from all of us, worshiping Jesus, and that's to be celebrated. But all of us came from one man, which means no race is better than another one. When I look at Washington, D.C., I was doing a little research on this. Despite black and white households having comparable rates of business ownership, the median white family's net worth is $284,000. For Hispanic families, it's $13,000. For black families, it's $3,500. White families' median net worth is 81 times greater than black families in our city. We have systems in place that need to be deconstructed. And we have gospel solutions. When I walk in a grocery store and my African-American wife walks in a grocery store, we have two different experiences. And the gospel speaks to us being of one race, us being created in the image of God. And so when there are things that are opposed to the gospel in our culture, we need to speak out against it. When our culture aids one group of people over another, engaging our culture means finding gospel solutions that work to dismantle that inequality. So first Paul, engages, first Paul feels the jealousy of God. Second, he engages the culture. And third, he preaches the message. And that moves us to our last question, which is how do we actually win this city? Think about it for a second. What strategies do we need to employ? What initiatives, what events, what programs, what laws? All those have their place. 
But Paul had a very different strategy. He preaches the message of Jesus Christ. Verse 31, he's fixed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he's given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. It's a very simple message. Jesus Christ died and he rose again. That's the message. You say, Pastor Stephen, I'm not a pastor. Sometimes I don't have the words. Let me help you this morning. Jesus died and he got up from the dead. That's all you need to know. And that his resurrection means now you can experience new life. Which means the person that's on the other side of the political aisle, that person that doesn't look like you, that person that might have idols in their life, that person can experience the same resurrection power that you've experienced in Jesus Christ. That's the message. That's what we preach. Paul's making it very clear, Athenians, the power that you've been looking for in these idols can only be found in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ walked this earth and had the power over temptation in that he never sinned. Jesus Christ exemplified true power by laying his life down. Jesus Christ proved himself to be God by rising from the dead. And it's that power that we proclaim. It's that power that gives life to anyone who believes. I know it's a tall task to win the city of Washington, D.C., the most powerful city in the world, a city full of idols. But if Jesus got up from the dead, I don't think you heard me this morning. If Jesus got up from the dead, I don't care how powerful the idols are in our city. I don't care how divided our nation is right now, how divided our city is right now. I don't care what's going on and the oppression and the darkness and the anxiety. If Jesus got up from the dead, then we have a message that can bring about transformation and can bring about our city being one. Amen? And you have a role to play in that. Whether you're here for three months, six months, five years, 10 years, or whether God has called you to devote your life to the city, you have a role in that. Figure out a way to feel God's jealousy, to engage the culture, and to preach this message. Amen? Father, we thank you that our faith is really simple. It's based on one event, you, Jesus Christ, getting up from the dead. That proved you to be God. And that's the message we want to proclaim in the city. We are asking you, God, to do what laws, programs, government agencies, political parties can't do. And to bring about the awakening and the revival that we need. Lord, we want to be a part of a people that win this city for you. If you're here and for the very first time in your life, you want to dedicate your life to Jesus Christ, or maybe you have been following God, but your life doesn't look like what a Christian's ought to look like. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Or if you're watching online, just raise your virtual hand. I want to pray for you. You've raised your hand. Pray with me. Say, Father, I'm sorry for the way I've lived. I choose today to turn from my sin. I believe that you, Jesus, died and rose again. Come into my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, if you could click the connect with us button if you're watching online, someone's going to pray with you. Or if you text new life to 25827. We want to connect you with you and help you in next steps in following Jesus.